Hello, Claudia. How are you? Hi. Welcome. Thank you. We have three minutes and we are going to be live after three minutes. So be so patient for next three minutes. Welcome, Marco. Can you hear me now? Yes, I hear you well. Welcome. Hello. Hello, yes. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Welcome. How are you? Thank you. So just let me, give me one second. I want to connect. Okay another device to have another monitor sure um, hmm. uh, welcome christian welcome for us nice to see you here hi christian uh, hi Elga. how are you uh, fine thank you what about you good good great i'm just outside with my family but i don't want to miss the chance to say mr marco hi <laughs> hello how are you mr marco Fine, and you? Good, doing great. Nice. I don't know. Okay. And uh, Marco, uh, we are also live on YouTube channel. Okay, okay, good. Yes. Uh, may I ask you, is there a way to see the, the meeting ID somewhere in Zoom? Because I don't know Zoom. Oh, I, I found I found it, I found it, I found okay, it. Okay, sure. Eight to five. Let me, uh, by the way, make you co-host, right? Okay. Uh, okay. Sure. Okay, I just connected another device. If you. Sure. Yes, I see. I good. have, right? Good, good. Okay. Give me one second. So, okay, got it. And I have to close this one here. Okay. So I put this here. Okay. Sure. It should be all good now. Nice. Yes, okay. uh, actually, it's time to start. If you don't yep. mind, yep, I would like to start with my presentation, and we'll go uh, go on with you. Okay. Uh, okay. Let me share my screen, and people will join in next minutes, right? Okay. So, do you see my screen, by the way? Yes. Sure. Well, um, I'd like. Uh, let me turn off. Let's say. Uh, this one, okay, good. Okay, uh, I'm always uh, starting with uh, one of the beautiful views of Azerbaijan and its capital city, Baku, which means okay. city of winds, right? And uh, this is Mud Volcanos, and uh, it can be considered one of the uh, miracles all over the world. So actually, let's say it's not, uh, the, uh, let's say, um, it has been created of mud or slurries, water and gases. And wow. these are not uh, igneous volcanoes as they do not produce lava and are not necessarily driven by magmatic activity. So it is uh, about one of the beautiful places of Baku. And then uh, I would like to give a little bit of information about uh, our speaker, first of all, uh, Today's speaker is Mr. Marco Russo. I have heard about you two years ago when I was uh, taking my advanced Power BI course at Ukrainian uh, platform circled LABA. 
my trainer was talking about two great Italian guys, Marco Russo and Alberto Ferrari. As of that time, I started to follow you. I started to follow you. And uh, once again, I'm very thankful to you that you accept my invitation. Today, Marco Russo uh, will uh, answer and will talk about the Red Bug engine. And we have today, uh, we'll have a live and question and answer session. And um, our next speaker is uh, Shabnam Watson from USA. And she will be talking about beginner's guide to publishing and sharing content in Power BI. It will take place on June 25th. And after Shabnam Watson, we'll have uh, Prakati Jane. She will be talking about button or bookmark tricks in Power BI to enrich reports. So uh, I would like once again, thank you for joining us. Enjoy the session and see you on June 25th. Now, uh, Marco, stage is yours. So here you are. Uh, yes, but sorry, this was, <laughs> I hope that this is, you remember, we did you provide the link to the session before? before sure. ah, okay, okay, okay. So, because the, the, the session is more a QA, so we did, did you receive uh, questions in advance or we have to? Oh, great. yes, I have received okay. and I have my question, so okay, no problem. Good. Okay. okay, 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 no, no, it's a, okay, so because I, I don't have a, I mean, if I need, I can share my screen, but unless I have something to show or to explain, we, I, I will start with some question, I don't know if you, where you want to start, because I don't have any presentation, because the presentation was already in the, in the session we yes. provided with the recording. Exactly. Okay. Sure. And uh, uh, one second, if you don't mind, I'm just going to uh, share this link, your YouTube link. So I think I can do it right. Okay. No, it's not what this one. It's really clear. And now I'm just going to begin with my question. Okay. Mm -hmm. yes. This is the link that Marco uh, shared with us. Okay. So, uh, uh, the first question is, uh, just as you may see from my screen, that that's yep. the structure for Webpack engine. So uh, so can we start with it? Yeah, what, what, what do you mean? I, I mean, mean uh, you... just a person is needed in the information regarding tax query structure for Webpack engine. So what's the relation? I mean, tax query structure with uh, Webpack engine. What does text query structure do for Vertipak engine? So what's the relation? I, I, I'm trying to understand the question because I, I don't... Um, uh, I mean, okay. I, I could have thousands of answers, so I, I need something more specific, right? So it's too generic this way because uh, okay. the, the answer is uh, everything, but I, I don't know... Can, can you specify better what you mean? Okay, so uh, in this case, let's go on with the next question. So one uh, of the attendants is asking, how do I run a query in Tech Studio? Okay. Actually, yes, it's right yeah. in Tech Studio. Okay, 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 okay. This is much simpler. I mean, the other one, the, the, the first one is not actually a question because I, I, I think it's a very broad topic. I could talk days, but I, I don't know exactly what you mean. So. Right. Uh, Deck Studio. So let's uh, let's see if I can share my screen. So give me one second. I have to share the screen, and I want to share the screen number two. Okay. Then I run Deck Studio. Oops. Oh. Then I run Deck Studio. One second only, and one moment. It is running, and then I also open Power BI Desktop. So let's see if I have a file, one second. Because I need, I need something to query before doing an example. And let's see, oh, okay. I can, I have a very large model that I'm loading now. So in the meantime, I could connect to this other, oh, I have this one. This one should be good. I'm connecting to analysis services in this case. No, no databases, so let's, get another one, so let's get, because the, the model I'm opening will take, 
a few seconds to open so I can connect in the meantime to Power BI the service. So one second only. Uh, I didn't, okay, let's go to another instance because the studio, when you have an error, when you open the studio and you connect to the first database and it, there is an error, even though you change the connection, you get an error again. So let me try again. This time it should work. And in a few seconds, we should see the databases we have in this uh, Power BI workspace. So one second, here we go. And I can connect to, for example, Contoso, this file. In the meantime, we have another file there. Come on. Not a good idea to connect to Power BI, which is on the cloud, but here we go. So in the user interface of DAX Studio, you can write DAX queries. And a DAX query is basically a syntax like evaluate followed by uh, a table expression. And the simplest table expression could be just the name of a table, like for example, store. If you write a query like that, it's like in SQL writing a select star from a store, which is uh, giving me all the columns, all the rows of the table. And when you click run, you see the result of the query that you executed uh, displayed here. Now we can also enlarge a little bit the font so it's uh, more readable. And basically this is the way you can run queries in Duck Studio. You have to write a table expression. Now the easiest way to get a table expression in Duck Studio is to uh, capture the query that you have in Power, Power BI, for example. So if I go in view performance analyzer, you can capture the queries that are executed for each visual that you have in your report. For example, here we have a single matrix that is displaying this data. If I copy the query here and then I connect Duck Studio to Power BI Desktop. In this case, I'm using the external two ribbons, so the connection is created automatically, and you see it is much faster working locally. I can paste the code, and you see that the query could be something that is way more complex than that, than what you have seen. And you also notice that for a single visual in Power BI, we might have, like in this case, one and two different evaluate statements with different order by. So when I click Run, I can see that the result that we see at the bottom here is made by two parts. The first query is returning one table that does just the list of the years. And the second query is returning one row for each cell that you see in the result. So you notice that, for example, in this query, we have uh, a column index, which is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, then it repeats, it repeats, it repeats. If I look at the query, uh, not at the query, at the visual we have in Power BI, you see that the year is what we have in the columns of this visual. And we have one row for each uh, hour in a day, and there is a number here. But each cell of the visual correspond to one row in the result of the DAX query. So sometimes you see this difference. The, the, the layout of the result of the DAX query is different from what you see in the visual. So this, this depends on the way Power BI works. But when you go in DAX Studio, you have to execute a DAX query. That's the thing. So you need to understand the syntax of evaluate. And when you execute your measure in Power BI, the measure is embedded in one of these queries that always return a table as a result of the query. OK. OK. Yes. And. Uh... We can go on with the next question. Yes. Right. Right. And the uh, one attendant is asking, uh, what is the VertiPark analyzer briefly, and what's yep. cardinality in uh, VertiPark uh, analyzer? Okay. So I share my desktop again. Now um, this start to be interesting because uh, so VertiPark analyzer. Uh, and unfortunately, the answer is not too short. So let me start from, from the beginning. So if I look for VertiPack Analyzer, you will find what? You will find uh, this page on SQL BI, which is a download of an Excel file that 
uh, can you see the screen? No, 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 no. repeat on that. Oh, wait a, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Oh, I, I just noticed it. Okay, so let's let me recap. So if I search, I, I went to a uh, search engine, I wrote uh, Vertipack Analyzer, and then I clicked on the first result, which is this page that contains a download, which is an Excel file. Now, this Excel file, so let's, uh, let's download this Excel file for a, one moment. So in the meantime, uh, I download it so I can also show you what we have here. So this is a zip file that I show you in a second. Here we go. That contains this uh, Excel file. I will open this Excel file in a moment because Vertipack Analyzer in reality, if I go to GitHub, Vertipack Analyzer is in reality a library which is an open source library, which has uh, uh, different features. Now, you don't use this library directly. This library is used in different tools. Uh, as of today, DAX Studio and Tabular Editor 3 are the two tools that use this library and other tools will come later. What is the purpose of this library? Now we can go to DAX Studio and see the integration of Vertipack Analyzer within DAX Studio, which is the following. If at this moment, DAX Studio is connected to the Power BI desktop that I opened before, which has a file open in my machine that is 1.4 gigabytes large. So it's, it's a huge file. So if I go in advanced and I click on View Metrics, View Metrics uses the library of Vertipack Analyzer and it scans the model looking for the, the size of the model in memory and the cardinality, uh, which I will explain in a moment what it is, but the number of rows, the number of unique values you have in each column. And let's start from the summary. The summary tells me that this model in memory is 10 gigabytes. So I started from a, a, a huge PBX file that is 1.4 gigabytes. And now I see that once it is loaded in memory, it is larger because uh, the, the, the PBX file is, is also compressed. It's, it's more compressed than the data that you have in memory. So how these 10 gigabytes are, um, uh, are consuming my memory? So when I go in this visualization tables, you see that for each table in the model, I can see the size, the table size. The table size is the sum of all the columns we have in the table. And you can see that the table audience has 11 gigabytes of RAM used in uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven columns. This column doesn't matter. This is just the raw number. It doesn't have any space. And you see that every column has a different size in memory. You see that the column that contains the time is a six gigabytes. So more than 50% of the entire table is just for one column. Then we have the weight, the individual key, the age. And you see that the, the column year is only spending 32 kilobytes of RAM to store five unique values. The cardinality that you see here has a different meaning depending on what you are displaying. If you're displaying a table name, this is the number of rows that you have in the table. If this is a column name, this is the number of unique values that are stored in that column. So this is an extreme case where we have 4 billion rows and we have only five unique values for the year column. Now, because you have a column that has a very small number of unique values, the compression of the column is much higher. And you see that the column year is stored in just 32 kilobytes. Now, Vertipack Analyzer is the library that analyzes the model and retrieves this data, plus much else. We have a lot of information here, like the, the, the data by column, the information about the relationships, the partitions, and other data that, are, that, is, that is not displayed here. What does it mean? The data collected by Vertipack Analyzer can be exported using this button, export matrix. And this export matrix saves a VPAX file. You see the extension, analyzer data. So let's save this uh, C demo audience dot vpax file that's i hope i i, I save this the right way okay now I'm, I'm storing this file this is a small file let's go to um uh, let's go here in explorer so before changing the directory let me open this file this excel file 
And in the meantime, I show you what I have in the demo folder where I store my audience VPAX file. You see that the file in PBI, the PBX file is 1.5 gigabytes, but the audience VPAX file is, is less than one megabyte. And usually it's much smaller. This is already a, a large uh, VPAX file, but, but the model is huge. So it's, it's always a fraction. Now, what can we do with this file? Uh, if I go in Excel, the Excel file I opened before, let's see where, where is my Excel file here. You see that the, the, the Excel file has extractions that I can, uh, wait a minute. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, I had, I made a mistake because I should have expand, I should have exported this file somewhere. So let's copy this. Copy and go here and I paste the code here. Okay, so I have to open this file from uh, uh, a local folder. I was opening from the zip folder and it was not working. Now, you see that here we have the instructions that explain what to do. So I, and now I skip the instructions. I go straight to this ribbon, Vertipack Analyzer, where I can open the VPAX file. So I can import the file that I saved now in this Excel file. What happens at this point? It will take a few seconds. So in the meantime, I explain what is happening. The VPAX file is a zip file that contains a lot of uh, CSV and JSON files that now we import in Excel in a Power Pivot model. At the end, we have a description of the content of the model, the, the BBX file, just in terms of statistics. So we don't export any sensitive data from the model. We just export the information about how many tables we have, how many columns, uh, how many unique values we have in each column, how many relationships, how many measures, how many calculated columns, and so on. So a lot of statistics that now we will display in this Excel file. And this could be useful to create a sort of documentation of the model, for example, because uh, we export all the DAX expressions that are included in the model. Uh, all the measures of the calculation groups of the uh, expressions for the row level security. And of course, we still have all the information about the, the tables, the columns and the relationships, but we also have more detailed information about the compression of the, the, the tables. For example, here, you see that now we have this visualization using a pivot table in Excel. Uh, this is similar to what we have seen in uh, uh, DAX Studio. The information is the same. But I just want to show you something that we didn't see in, uh, in uh, Duck Studio, like for example, this uh, uh, analysis about the compression rate. This is the compression divided by number of bits. These are very, very detailed information about the, how the Vertipack uh, engine is storing data in memory, uh, the compression by data type, the different encoding type, hash encoding, value encoding that has been used and in which columns and so on. And these are information that could be very useful for uh, very large models where you want to, you know, save as more data as possible. And the, the topics described in the session, the recorded session, describe how to understand the meaning of the different type of encoding, different type of compression and so on. The last uh, page, we can see the... Um, DAX expressions that we have. Now, in this case, we have only four measures, but you can click this button and you can format the code in this Excel file so that you have a sort of documentation of all the measures that you have, all the measures of the calculated columns you have in the model. And, and this could be useful. Sometimes I, I, I often use this tool to get an analysis of the, of the model I receive from a customer, for example, that, that sometimes is very useful. Um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, we covered everything this way. So Vertical Analyzer is a tool and an Excel file, but it's a library and it is integrated in different tools that we have uh, uh, available in the community sites. Okay, so stop share. Hello? Okay. I thank you. Um, uh, I think, uh, yes, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, I see that there are questions. Do you hear my I, I don't see the video. 
and and I don't I don't hear anyone. Hello. Uh, unrelated question: If a power bank takes a lot of time to load. Sorry, I I, I cannot hear. Just... Yeah, it breaks up. I don't hear uh, Ilgar either. Hmm. I put some questions on the chat, Marco. Now nah, your uh, yeah, I think yeah. the camera is off. Okay. Okay, so I, I try to read the questions from the chat window. So let's see. Uh, the first one I see, I had another little question. If a Power BI takes a lot of time to load, is it because calculated tables are calculated every time the Power BI is open? Uh, no. Uh, no, it is not for that. It depends on a number of um, operations that are made when you open the file. But uh, I try to answer in 20 seconds. When you open the PBX file, you open a zip file that is uncompressed. One of the files that is there is another is a backup file of analysis series, which is another zip file that is uncompressed. And then it explodes a number of files that describe the model in memory. And these files are then loaded in RAM. And so you have CPU, IO, and you know many things happening. If you want more details about that, I can give you a spoiler. Tomorrow morning, we we'll publish uh, an unplugged video on SQL BI that describes exactly this process. So I recorded for 20 minutes uh, describing all the steps and with the task manager and other tools, we analyze what is happening. But basically, no, it's not a calculated table. The calculated table is evaluated only when you refresh the, the model. But when you just open a PBX file, nothing is calculated at that point. It's just uh, already calculated. But of course, if you have a calculated table, uh, when you refresh the model, then when you refresh the model, uh, yes, the calculated table is evaluated. Or when you change the model. So for example, in Power BI, when you modify a measure, you might have to uh, rebuild the calculated table. And this could take a while if the calculated table is, uh, is expensive. And this is one of the reasons why you might want to use tabular editor to edit your measures or uh, your expressions to avoid this recalculation to happen all the time that you touch any attribute, any property. Okay. So I, I move forward with the next question. Then uh, when Edgar, uh, if, if you have to, to ask, don't worry. So question I see here, how important is sorting data in Power Query before loading data in data model? Does it tell? Uh, yes, this is a good question because uh, uh, as you probably have seen in the in the recording uh, in the recorded session about Vertibac, Vertibac reads data and and and, and compresses the data, and the sort of the data could affect the compression. But how? Because uh, Vertibac it actually reads uh, not just a few rows; reads one million rows at a time in Power BI or eight million rows in uh, analysis services, and then it try to sort this data in memory to find the optimal sort order to improve the compression. So let's say that in theory, if you have less than 1 million rows, it shouldn't make any difference. Because if you sort the data, but then the data, if you don't sort the data, but then the data is sorted in, by the algorithm, you will get the same compression. Uh, this is true in theory, but in practice, there are a couple of things that could happen. First, if you have too many columns in a table, hundreds of columns in a table, then uh, the number of combinations for sorting the data is so high that the, the, the engine cannot try all the possible combinations. And so it is possible that the engine will not find the ideal combination. But for sure, the original sort order will be tried first. So it's possible that the, the, the best combination is the one that you provide as a, as, as a sort order. Uh, the second thing that can happen is that the table is larger than the size of a segment. The segment, let's say the segment is 1 million rows. If, if the table is, uh, let's say, 100 million rows in uh, Power BI, you will end up having 100 segments. So 100 uh, operation of read 1 million rows in memory, sort the data, and then compress. Now, if you think about what is happening, the sorting happens in a window of 1 million rows only, which could be non optimal. Maybe that if you get a few tens thousands of rows in each of these 100 segments, you could get a much better compression. So there is a possibility that if you sort the data, you will get a, an optimal sort order across a much larger window of rows compared to the window of rows 
that are already in memory for one million rows, the, the, the standard segment. Can this impact the, the, the compression in a significant way? It depends. Uh, usually not much. On average, you will not find much difference. The difference is, there, there could be a difference, but it could be minimal. There are a few side cases where this could be important but I would call them side cases. So it's, it's, it's not something frequent. You have to balance that with the idea that sorting the data before importing the data could be expensive. So if it is free to sort the data in advance, of course, do that. But you might spend more time sorting the data than importing data in Power BI. So at the end, you might extend the duration of the refresh instead of improving the performance. And again, the compression saving that you could obtain could be minimal, so it depends. I don't know if it worth the effort to do that. You have to try. But this potentially, potentially it could work, but it depends. Yeah, this is the reason why I've asked because sorting in Power Query is an expensive operation. Oh yeah, in Power Query, yes. But if you create proper index in SQL Server, for example, that could be yeah, that could be better. Thank you. Okay, so the next question is. Uh, what is the impact of a sort column by to the compression, if any? Uh, no, there... To the compression, there are no differences. I'm thinking because when you use sort by, you actually uh, create one additional structure, which is used by MDX. Uh, you know, we have, we have column attributes, but we have user hierarchies. And these column attributes we create are sorting each column according to the sort order of the column. Now, the sort order of the column is the natural sort order of the number you have, unless you have sort by column. Because if you have sort by column, the column is sorted by using the other column, because this is the natural sort order that you will get in MDX in, uh, in Excel, for example. Um, I would say that the compression doesn't change because uh, the compression is made on the raw data and it ignores the sort order. The sort order is just applied to the list of the unique values you have for the column. Indeed, the cost of this structure is the cost of the unique values you have in the column, not the size of the table, right? So if you have a column that has a small number of unique values, that structure is small in any case, but I would say that it doesn't, it doesn't affect the compression. It affects other structures, but I would not, I would not see a difference in, in, in memory size. Uh, Igor, can I, should I move forward with the questions or do you want to say something? No, no, uh, we can go on, no problem. Actually, we have also uh, some question from Rams of Berali. Okay. So if you don't mind, I can read or you can read. Yeah, 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 as you want, as you prefer, no problem. Okay, okay. DEX is only used for descriptive analytics, he asked this, or we can do predictive analytics or uh, prescriptive analytics, or the visuals available like Python or R and R, we need to learn that as well. What are your thoughts? He asked it. He's asking. Can, can you show the text the of the? Uh, can you show the? Sorry, again. Sorry, can you show the text of the questions? Because uh, sometimes I have to read the question multiple times before understanding the implications. So. Marco. You, yeah. The last one on the chat. Ah, the last one in the chat. Okay. Uh, okay. So, <laughs> the, the easy answer is no, but a more complex answer is that as, as a language, DAX doesn't have any feature for predictive analytics because it, DAX doesn't have the ability to create complex calculations. Let, let me explain. DAX is a language is a functional language where you cannot create new new functions so you don't have a few elements that would enable to implement any algorithm for example is very complex uh, dax is, doesn't have recursion 
doesn't have functions. So if you want to create an algorithm, or if you want to implement an existing algorithm for doing certain calculations, it's almost impossible. We have a few workarounds for a few things, but in general, I would say no. Which means that if you have, uh, for example, we can do a linear regression. Sorry? Oh, sorry, I, I hear noise. So if you have, uh, for example, a simple linear regression is uh, something you can implement in DAX, but if you look at the code for a linear regression is already, you know, a simple format is already a complicated formula in, in DAX. And when you have more complex algorithms, that could be almost impossible. So from this point of view, I would say no. But Power BI has predictive features. And if you look at what happens in uh, query uh, with, with, with performance analyzer, you will discover a query index that has uh, the request for predictive functions. What, how, how is it possible? Where these functions used in Power BI are not part of the DAX language, are part of a specific extension for Power BI of the DAX language. Imagine that you can write functions, you can extend the DAX language writing functions in C-sharp, okay? This is technically possible, even though it is not documented by Microsoft, but it is used by Power BI to implement the predictive analytics. So in a way, there is a way to implement additional, to extend the DAX language with uh, predictive functions, but the DAX language by itself doesn't have this feature and the predictive functions that you have available in uh, Power BI are not documented, so they're not supposed to be used by the end users and are only available in Power BI. For example, that they are not available in analysis services. So it's a, it's a specific extension for Power BI that is not today available for other purposes. And it is not documented. So even though you, you can spy what they do, but we don't have a documentation about that. Uh, uh, you are muted. Sure, sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe you have answered this question because of my disconnection, I didn't uh, hear. So uh, one is asking, um, uh, how can we reduce the catenality? Maybe you answered, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it depends. The cardinality is the number of unique values. So, okay, let's talk about cardinality. Cardinality, there are two, um, two meaning of this term. The cardinality for the table is the number of rows you have in a table, just to reduce the number of rows. But I, I don't know how you can reduce the number of rows if not by aggregating data and removing some detail about the data. Then the cardinality for a column correspond to the number of unique values you have in a column. And this could be complex, right? But it depends, it depends. For example, imagine I import uh, the transactions from uh, a, um, a web server or a server that monitors something. And you have a timestamp, a timestamp and there is an event. Now, if you get the timestamp, and you store the timestamp as is, how many unique values you have in the table? Probably a unique value for, for every row. So the cardinality is very high, close to the number of rows of the table. Compression is very bad, performance is bad. But when you do the analysis of that column, you are unlikely to analyze uh, date and time together. 95% of the times you analyze grouping or filtering by date, or by time, or together, but in two different axes. For example, I have a visualization I use often where I have uh, the day of the week in one col uh, the day of the week in the columns and the time of the day in the rows. So you have 24 rows, seven uh, columns. And in this matrix, you have a heat map that shows uh, which are the peak hours during the different days of the week. And if you think about what kind of analysis you're doing, you, are, you want to group by date and by time, but using two different attributes. You don't want to use the same attribute for that. So it's common to split date and time in two columns for analysis. 
I totally agree. When you record this event in SQL, uh, that's fine. You can use one column only. But when you do the analysis over that, it's much better to transform that in single column in two columns. Now, if you split date and time, what happens? Well, you have 365 days in a year and you have the same time repeated every day. So you start reducing the number of sneak values. Moreover, do you really need the milliseconds? Maybe you just need the seconds. Maybe you just need the minute. Maybe you just need the hour because you don't do any analysis at the minute level. So you can reduce the cardinality by reducing the uh, precision of your time, for example. So there are columns, there are attributes that could be reduced in cardinality because you can remove the details that you don't need for the analysis. Another example is the uh, floating point number. If you have a floating point number, what is this floating point number? Uh, is the temperature that you get from an external device. And this temperature has a lot of decimal points. So every time you read the temperature is always different. But actually when you look at the, the, the number, you look at only at the first uh, decimal the first digit after the the first digit after the decimal point, which means that you probably can reduce the number of unique values by removing the the digits in the uh, after the second uh, digit in the decimal part of the of the number, and this again reduces the, the the cardinality of the of the of the column. If you have money, probably you don't want to remove the cardinality, even though, again, you could split the number into numbers, but at this point, you just move the problem somewhere else. You reduce the cardinality, you reduce the dictionary, but you increase the size of the data of the overall table. It's a, it's, it's a complex uh, problem to explain, but let's say that for large volume of data, splitting the number into numbers is not a big advantage. It's an advantage when the, da when the database is small. And, 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 and at that point, it could be an advantage because the reduction in the dictionary is much more important. So it depends, but you basically you have to reduce something. So you have to reduce something without losing the ability to do the analysis that you want. That's, that's uh, what you should do. Okay. Uh, you're muted. Yeah, I got it. Before going to, uh, with my question, uh, Elbina uh, is asking uh, one question in chat box. Yep. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. What do you think will be the future of DAX? If I'm not wrong, recently there was an announcement that Microsoft works on replacing DAX with natural language. Okay, so uh, Microsoft never said that they are going to replace DAX with natural language. They, Microsoft shown a demo Microsoft a video, not even a demo, where writing natural language, they obtain DAX code, which is a very different thing than saying that this will be replaced. I will not comment anything about that until I have something to try, because as of today, it's impossible to, to provide any comment. It's just speculation, and I cannot say. I mean, I, I could, you can imagine what I think, but I want to be, you know, I want to give a chance and I want to try it. Maybe it works. We'll see. Okay. Um, by the way, I would like to myself uh, also ask one question regarding um, M language. Uh, it's said that uh, all the things that you are doing regarding the modeling in Power BI, 80% of these kind of things is done with Power Query and 20% with DAX. Do you agree with this idea or not? What is the percentage? Sorry, can you repeat? 18, 80 to 20. 80% 80 is done by query, power query, but 20% yeah. is done by DEX. Yeah. Uh, yeah, why not? I mean, the let's say that I, I, I would describe this in a different way. Apply any transformation to the data as soon as possible, okay? Don't wait to reach the report to transform your data. No, this is wrong. You should, so what is important is that the, the Power BI is a tool that is a reporting system. Like any reporting system, it is designed to provide uh, reports 
And the best way to obtain reports is to have, is to have a proper data model for the analysis you want to do, which means that you might have data that is structured in a way in your data source. It doesn't mean that you have to get the data as is. The data has in a data source is structured in a way depending on the purpose for which that data was collected, which could be different when you do a, an analysis. So first of all, create a data model for your analysis. When you, when you hear that. you should use task schema is because of this, right? Oh. You, you should use a you should use a, um, um, a structure that is uh, good for the analysis that you want to implement. And how do you obtain this proper data model? Transform the data as soon as possible. Can you do this? Uh, can, can someone else do this job for you better? Can someone create a start schema for you and you just get the data already transformed? Best thing you can do. Can you do this with a view in SQL? Good, I mean, better than nothing. Nobody did anything. You have to do this job and you don't know SQL, you can use Power Query, of course. But it would be wrong to do this last transformation in DAX. DAX is supposed to do the, I mean, if you have a proper data model, the amount of DAX you have to write is minimal. What should we do with DAX? Not data transformation, but calculation, business calculation, something that you want to be dynamic. For example, I want that when, when the user click on some slicer, I want to change the report. I want to, I want to apply simulation. I want to inject a different parameter in a calculation that has to do something uh, at query time because I want to apply, for example, I, 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 want, I want to run a simulation depending on what I select in a slicer. I want to change the budget and I want to simulate what happens if I increase by 5% the cost and I increase by 7% the the, uh, the, the price of the goods that I sell, what happens? Okay, for this kind of analysis, you want to use DAX because you want something that is interactive. But if you can pre-calculate anything, do that because doing that in DAX is just more expensive and slower. And, uh, and so it would be wrong. And this is regardless of the fact that you use Power Query. I mean, Power Query is your last resort to do something before it is too late. If you're using Power Query too much, I would say, well, wait a minute, maybe that you can prepare something before of that, because otherwise you end up doing the same transformation again and again and again every time. So maybe that you can prepare the data in advance. For example, data flow do that. If you see that you apply the same transformation in too many data sets, you could do the transformation only once and store the result in a data flow so that you load the data from the data flow and you don't have to apply the transformation every time, for example. Okay. Uh, thank you for your answer. And I would like to go on with the, uh, with the next question. Uh, someone is asking, uh, what is X velocity? So, sorry, what is? Uh, X velocity. Um, okay. Uh, X velocity is, is, is a name uh, that uh, Microsoft used as a marketing name for the technology that now we prefer to call Vertipak. Let me give you a, a short history of that. When Microsoft worked on the core technology of what is called today Power BI, they created a new engine that was called Vertipak. It was the code name, the internal code name of the project. But when they launched the, uh, the tool, which was at that time a Power Pivot for Excel and uh, Analysis Services Tabular, they had to provide a new marketing name and the marketing name was uh, uh, X Velocity. X Velocity was this marketing name that after a few years also Microsoft uh, uh, ignored and they moved to other names. Uh, but at the same time, we still had to call the engine in some way. So we prefer to use Vertipak because it is the name used in the internal events that we can analyze. And we, for example, the DAX Studio capture to get the information about the performance. And so we preferred to use Vertibug because it was the code name, it, will, it is used in internal events and it's not gonna change. It's, it's not a marketing name, it's a technical name, but at least we can write an article and it, it is not obsolete in two years and, and, and it, is, it is just better. Uh, Roches Maxim, 
data should be transformed as far upstream as possible and as far downstream as necessary. That's a very, very good point that, uh, that also Matthew Rocky uh, brought in his blog. And absolutely, I totally agree 100%. Um, in, the, in the meantime, I, I was looking at the chat window, and there was a um, there was a, 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 some comment about GPT three and and the natural uh, uh, language queries. And uh, again, let me explain why I prefer not to comment. The reason is simple. When I uh, provide consulting, uh, I often do remote consulting and we have, you know, maybe we allocate one hour for a remote consulting with a customer. In my experience, the first 45 minutes are necessary only to understand the question. And the reason for that is that I, uh, for example, imagine that a customer is not able to write a formula. So they ask Marco, I, I, I need to, to write a formula for, for, for doing this. And I spend 70, 80% of the time of the call just to clarify the question, just to understand what do they mean with the question? Because uh, when they ask, oh, we want to see the return of investment for this. Okay, I look at the data model and I say, okay, what, what do you want to, to get if you filter by this dimension, if you filter by this attribute, what, 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 what is the behavior you expect if you had this? When you have two or more fact tables, it's, it's, you know, it happens all the times. So I'm wondering, how is it possible that by writing a sentence without an interaction, so without receiving, assuming that it works, but how is it possible that without providing more details about the question in case they are needed by the entity that received the question, how is it possible to provide the result that you expect? Probably you get one of the possible results, which is a completely different thing. And what happens if I ask the question and the result is not what I really want? The first question is, can I understand whether the result is good or not? Because if you have a system that from a sentence in English generates a, a code in DAX. And the DAX is complex. And the person who received this, DAX, this code in DAX cannot understand the DAX language and can only see the result. I'm just wondering, how is it possible that they will trust or they will use the result if they are not able to understand whether the result corresponds to what they expect? And I'm wondering, how is it possible that Sometimes we have conversations that run for 30, 40 minutes. And how is it possible that the initial question asked at the beginning of this conversation could have produced the code that we obtain after 40 minutes? That is what I'm asking. So for simple things, of course, it would work. But as soon as you have a real model with real questions, real business questions, Allow me to okay, be skeptical. Marco, I mean, uh, allow me to, to be skeptical about, about that. I, I, I don't know. How, how, I, I, I try to say how a person could do that, uh, not even uh, artificial intelligence system. So let's see. I mean, maybe that it, it works for simple cases. I, I don't know. I want to try it, and then I will say what I think about that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Marco. Yep. And uh, let me go on with next two uh, or three questions. So uh, one is asking, what is Wettepack memory? Sorry, what do you mean? I don't know, it, it's it's question. And uh, the next one is how do I allocate memory to analysis services? Uh, but is it is written in the chat window or do you have- No, 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 it's my, uh, I mean, uh, ah, okay. question that I re received, yes. Uh, can can uh, can you show the question? So maybe that uh, if I sure it, sure I... sure. I'm just going to share, right? Okay. 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 Oh, here, this one, eighties and nineties. Okay. Um. So the, my problem with this question is that it could, I, I could provide an answer, but I don't, I don't understand whether the answer could be correct or not. So because the VertiPak memory is the memory used by the VertiPak engine. 
I, I will not. I, I don't know how to answer different way. The, the second question was uh, how to allocate memory to analysis services. But again, analysis services re request data to the operating system. The operating system provide the 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 memory to analysis services. So I I don't know exactly what what does it mean to because. I, because usually you don't have to, I mean, what I mean is that you don't have to worry about that. Uh, it's Power BI that manages that. And you don't have to, to worry about providing more memory. It's something, uh, you either have memory or not in your machine. That's the point. So you, th there is not much that you can do. On a server where you install analysis services on premises and you have also SQL Server running, there could be settings that you can configure for uh, uh, limit the memory for analysis services, for example, but that's a completely different story. So the question at that point would be, how can I limit the memory for analysis services? Because I have other services that have to run. Okay, that's another question, but I don't think it's the question that you ask. Uh, hello? I don't hear anyone. Hello? There are still some questions upstream yep. on the chat. If you have time, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can I can move forward with a with a with the chat window. So, uh, let's see. Uh, we started from here. Uh, sort by column. Calcul okay, as calculated columns created with DAX are compressed only after the entire table was compressed. Is it safe to say that calculated columns in Power Query is better than doing them in DAX, or this is also it depends questions? No, 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 no. From the uh, always it depends, but from the point of view of the compression, yes, it's uh, it's better to um, to pre-calculate the column. Uh, with Power Query or with other systems before you actually import the data. So if you can have uh, your data uh, prepared, uh, the compression works better because uh, the, the column participates to the compression. But as usual, as usual, it depends on, on, on many things. For example, um, you might have uh, a column that is expensive to compute if it is executed uh, in uh, uh, Power Query. For example, imagine a column that has to get the value from other tables, like something that you will do with a related uh, function in a DAX calculate column or a lookup value. And the result is different for every row. So the compression will be minimal because the result depends on too many variables. And there is a part of the calculation that depends on a uh, external table that for Power Query will be very expensive, but it is not expensive at all for DAX. In that case, I could use um, a calculated column or a calculated column in a fact table is something that I'm scared to implement in DAX. Whereas a calculated column in that dimension that usually is a small table, I don't care about the additional or reduced compression because maybe the dead column has to use data from many other tables and the time required to evaluate that column in Power Query will, will, will slow down the entire refresh. So in this case, in this sense, it depends. But if you just look at the compression, uh, all the times prepare the calculate columns outside of Power BI, of course. Then we have a uh, uh, next question I have here. Are there any general guidelines to reduce materialization time and size? Uh, or this is combination of data model and part optimizing portion? Huh. The biggest, uh, so th there are two common um, problems that can generate materialization. The first one is um, context transition. Every time you have a context transition, you have a potential materialization. Uh, it's more complex than that in reality, but let's say that if you avoid calling a major reference in a large iterator, you already reduce the reason for the materialization in a large number of cases. The second one is the presence of table filters in Calculate or 
the um, presence of bidirectional filters in the model. When you have these two elements, these, these are other possible conditions for a large materialization or not for large materialization, but for an ex for a excessive use of the storage engine. So you have many short calls to the storage engine, but there are so many that slow down the, the performance. That, that these two elements are the, the ones that you have to control more. Now, because this happens often, because you have the wrong data model, if you have a proper data model with a star schema and shared dimensions, usually you simplify the DAX code and by simplifying the DAX code, you reduce the necessity to create to, to use these uh, techniques. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that usually helps in, in a direct way. Uh, then we have, I was surprised to learn from your video that columns involved in the relationships are always hash encoded. Is this true even for small integers, for example? Are they hash encoded even if it would be normally value encoded? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, it's so, what can I say? The reality is more complex as usual because uh, the rule is that when you do a full refresh, the relationship is hash encoded, but I remember that there is a there is a way there is a sequence of operation where we can create. I think that if when you create the relationship, if I remember when you create the relationship, uh, if you create a relationship between two columns that are value encoded, if I remember well, they are kept value encoded. But as soon as you refresh the model or you refresh the tables involved, the columns are encoded in hash encoded, and uh, yeah, it could be not ideal. I mean, there was a reason I, when I talked with Max, there was a reason why they did that, but I don't, I don't remember exactly. But because when you refresh the model, they are all hash encoded, there is not much we can do. So, and I, I think when we did some analysis, we didn't find a particular advantage in using the value encoding. So uh, I would not be too worried about that. Even though I understand that there are cases where you might want to remove the dictionary for a column that has just an integer with a with a sequential value. I know, I know, but word is not perfect, so. Um, I skip to the next, so it's next question. It's, I'm, on my job interview, I was asked, please describe briefly main principles behind Vertipack Engine. I don't know was my answer. Now, with your video and explanation, I moved from the zone of entire, I don't know, to Zona know something. Thank you for all. Oh, thank you for it. I'm surprised that someone asked you asked this in a in a in a in an interview. Um, unless the uh, unless the goal of the question is another one is to is to check whether a, a person uh, go beyond the uh, you know the 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 typical you know superficial documentation or superficial knowledge. So if you if you have an idea about how it works, probably this tells me that you also explored something more than just the, the, the surface. And this could tell more. So in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few questions, I could get more from a candidate rather than trying to go top down. So I go top down, I have to investigate in a number of things. If I, if I, if I ask random questions at the bottom, and I see that there is a good knowledge of the technical stuff that are underneath. If I'm looking for someone who is very technical, that could be a way to, to shorten the, the interview, maybe. I don't know. This is not a question I would consider important, to be honest, because uh, uh, especially, I mean, the need of understanding the internals of Vertipack is not something that you have to know in advance before getting a job, in my opinion. It's something that you can learn. It's, it's not rocket science so. So the, the next is a question. So considering compression recommendations you have made in the video, is it safe to say that doing that doing an aggregation on daily from daytime or weekly from daily will decrease? Let me read. Uh, this is the reason I had to read this multiple times. Is it safe to say that doing an aggregation daily from daytime or weekly from daily data will decrease the size of uh, Christian, you should clarify what do you mean 
by aggregation. Are you talking about pre-aggregating data or are you talking about creating aggregation in direct query? That This is not clear. So I don't, I don't understand the question. If you can clarify later, I, I will answer. Uh, next question is DAX is only for, oh no, this is the descriptive analytics. We talked about that before. We talked about GPT-3. So I'm scrolling down to the last questions I received. And one question is, can we use uh, DAX for Excel web or will it soon available? Oh, uh, so, uh, <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I understand the question because this question has many meaning probably. So if the question is, can I use Excel integrated with Power BI? The answer is yes. Can I use Excel published on the web integrated with Power BI? The answer is not yet, but Microsoft is started, started to release an update to Power BI so that you can publish a pivot table in Excel connected to a Power BI dataset and it just works. Something that you, I mean, when you use analysis in Excel, it works locally, but it didn't work when you published this. And now it should work, even though it is not, I, I don't remember if they already deployed in, a, in all the tenants or not. So it is not a feature that, uh, if I understood well, it's not a feature that is already available to everyone. Maybe someone can already use it and someone else cannot, but it, it should come. But, when you use Excel this way, you're not using DAX, you're using MDX because Excel connects the pivot table to the data source, to the data set using MDX because MDX is another language that is understood by the analysis services engine. Is it bad? No, I mean, it works, but if you look at the performance, there are a few things that MDX does that could be not as efficient as DAX can do. So for certain reports, MDX is not the best language. For example, if you want to create a table, a huge table with many, many, many rows, MDX will be slow for sure, whereas DAX could be good enough. So can you use DAX in Excel? Yes, but you don't have an editor. I mean, you have to type your DAX code somewhere, for example, in DAX Studio, and then you can run the, the DAX code in Excel in a table. You can do that. There is a video I published in an unplugged video a few months ago, I think, that has exactly this scenario described. So I start with a, with a query that I want to execute that provides me detailed information about the customers. I want to get this as a table in Excel. If I run this kind of query in MDX, it would be very, very, very slow. But if I do this in, in DAX, it's, it's fast. But and, and I want to get the result in Excel. And you can do that. It's just not automated. It's not helped. But you can do that. If you if you need to execute DAX in an Excel table, you can. And, and the video describes how to do that. I don't know if it answered the, the question, but that's uh, the, the only relationship with DAX that uh, we have in Excel. Um, can you give a simple explanation of the formula and storage engine? Uh, the simplest explanation is the formula engine understands DAX, the storage engine does not. The storage engine retrieves the data from the storage, the formula engine doesn't know where the data is stored. Imagine the storage engine is an engine that gets the data from the memory or from the disk or from whatever, and it is a module. So you have always the same formula engine Whereas the storage engine can be, can, can be switched. You have the storage engine that is called Vertipack when you, use, uh, when, when you import data in memory. But when you use direct query, you use another storage engine. You use your SQL Server as a storage engine. The formula engine is always the same. Even though the formula engine adapts the requests that are made to the storage engine, depending on the storage engine. So there are different query plans depending on you have Vertipack, you have direct query, which kind of direct query you have. So there are differences in the formula engine for that, but the, but, but the role is clear. The formula engine does DAX or MDX, the storage engine just get the data from the relational source or the memory or whatever. Uh, so 
It was about pre aggregation. Some data, if details are not needed for analysis, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm reading, I'm reading the, I'm reading the, the Christian reply about uh, the aggregation, and it was about the, the pre aggregation. Yes. Uh, Marco? Yep. Uh, I have two general questions. Actually, I have asked you uh, a few months ago, but uh, I'm just going to ask it again. So, uh, where must we use many to many uh, relationship? I mean, where I I is it must for uh, usage? Because uh, generally, trainers, when they train Power BI, they say that you, know, you should avoid using many to many uh, relationship. So, um, where uh, is it must to use? So, sorry, I, I didn't understand well because it, it's uh, a little bit uh, noisy. So, can you repeat or write a question so I can understand better? Okay, I'm just going to repeat it again. So, yes. uh, when must we use many to many relationship? I mean, ah, okay, okay. So, that, that was the question. Yeah, uh, only if you cannot avoid that. That's simple. No, I mean, the, so first of all, we have, I think there is an article on SQL BI about different types of many to many, different types of relationship and different types of many to many relationships. We have two different, when you say many to many relationships, unfortunately, I don't understand what you mean because uh, uh, there are two different uh, concepts. One is the many to many relationship between business entities which is a concept that existed in the business intelligence world for 40 years, maybe. And, and so I, I, I understand that. Then there is a feature in Power BI that is called many-to-many -many relationship, which is a completely different thing, which is a relationship between two tables that don't have a, a primary key, but is a, is a relationship that is a, a normal relationship. And usually it should be a single direction relationship, even though the default is bi-directional, which is completely wrong. So that's a, that's a problem. So if you, if you, if you, if we're talking about many to many relationship between, uh, between, between business entities, well, if your model requires that fine, but is not, that is not the many to many relationship in Power BI. When we talk about the many-to-many -many relationship with Power BI, we're talking about um, something that you can obtain also using two relationship and a table in the middle. So if you have that kind of requirement, okay, you, you can use the many-to-many the, the -many relationship only when you have a small amount of uh, unique values in the column that connect the two tables, because otherwise it would be much slower than the alternative. So if you if you look at that article, that the, there is a long description. But basically, usually you should justify the reason why you're using a many-to-many -many relationship. If you're not able to justify that, just don't use it. The, the justifying means okay, I have um, two fact tables, sales and budget, and the budget has a, a granularity that is not that does not correspond to the granularity of the sales. The budget is by brand. The sales are by product and brand is a group of products. So different cardinality requires in order to share the same dimension and to avoid a snowflake, you want to use the many to many cardinality relationship. But if you didn't have the many to many cardinality relationship, you could have used a snowflake schema and you could have used exactly the same one to many relationship we always use. So it's just a shortcut to, to do something to, 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 to avoid creating an additional uh, relationship and an additional table at the cost that it is lower. So you, you do something, that you, you save the editing time of the model, paying a penalty when you query the model, and you could create confusion, especially if you don't set the proper direction. So my, my problem with the, with the feature is that it is, not, it, it is easy to use the wrong way. So it's, it's easier to say, don't use it, rather than saying you have to use it when it is the right thing to do. And it is the right thing to do only if A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So there are a lot of conditions that have to be true in order to use it safely. And so if you don't have time, oh, I want a sure, I, I want the best practice, don't use it. Because it's simpler, right? So I can tell you, you can use it if you do this and then this and then this and then this, but people don't listen, don't read. And so 
it's easier to say, don't use it. So people are scared and they know that it, there is a danger in using it in terms of performance and in terms of the um, calculation. Because when you introduce the many-to-many -many cardinality relation, the, the one in Power BI, you introduce the um, uh, non-additive uh, behavior of your measures. And the non-additive behavior of their measure sometimes means that you look at the numbers and they are not what you expect. And if you realize that, good, but if you don't realize that, you could publish a report that has numbers that are wrong and nobody realizes that until it is too late and some uh, manager says, oh, this is, this is bad and, and, and you're fired, for example. So don't, pay, pay attention. Right? Thank you for your answer. And uh, if you don't mind, I would like to ask two more general questions. And if there is no question, we can, I think, end this session. Uh, let me ask my question. You know, uh, uh, there are a lot of analytical tools like uh, tab, uh, Tableau or GalaxySense and uh, Power BI, etc. Uh, Tipco, if I'm not mistaken. So um, the question is that why should I uh, learn Power BI? And what are the advantages and pluses in comparison with other analytical tools? So, it's uh, I, I mean, I can provide you uh, practical reasons. So, first of all, if the question is from uh, an end user that has to use to consume the tool, I would say, oh, well, try them and use whatever is better for your work, for your job. I mean, there is not, if my goal is to create nice looking reports, I will use Tableau because Power BI is not even close to Tableau in terms of quality of the, of the final result of the report. But for everything else is better. So, and for the business, so from my point of view, for, for a business user who has to manage usually business data, balance sheets, sales, cost, margin, KPIs in the company. Power BI has all you need and is less expensive and has a much broader ecosystem and can be better integrated with your um, infrastructure, especially if you're already in the Microsoft technologies and who doesn't have Excel, for example. So. If my job is to create reports that have to be published on a newspaper every week, I would probably use other tools because Power BI is not the best tool to do that job, for sure. Um, so as an end user, it depends on what you're doing. And as a consultant, oh, it's easy. Uh, as of today, Power BI has the largest uh, number of users compared to any other product and it could grow much more because if you get as a benchmark the number of users of excel and you say okay 10 percent of the users of excel will use power bi in some way or another and 10 percent of the user of power bi will create models and 10 percent of these users will create uh, models that require my consulting do the math you start from around 800 million of users in the world of uh, excel uh, so 10% is 80 million of users for uh, Power BI. So which means that Power BI could grow at least of one or two orders of magnitude compared to what we have today. And which means that the number of model developers are around 8 million in the world, which means that you, I mean, you do the math. Any other tool, I mean, when you look, look at the number, look at the, you want to you want numbers the public companies have to publish information and you can see you can know how many companies how many customers tableau has how many customers have so as a consultant you don't want to know how many users a tool has you want to know how many companies because you need customers and one company is one customer not one user and if, if, if there is a company that has 1 million users, but this is only one company, it, it counts one, is, is one possible customer. So as a consultant, it's simply uh, a much uh, 
broader market that has many more opportunities from my point of view, because companies are adopting Power BI. Uh, so this is the reason why I will, I will invest in it as a consultant. Then if you are a data scientist and you create reports for, uh, for your organization, as I said, it depends. It could be a tool, but it could be not the best tool for, uh, for example, you want to create custom chart, you want to do, uh, you want to run scripts in Python. Yes, there is an integration, but come on, there are many other tools that can do the same and maybe you don't need Power BI. So it depends as usual, but. Thank you uh, for your uh, answer. If you don't mind, one more question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, a few years ago, uh, five or six years ago, I started learning uh, Power Pivot, uh, Power um, View, and Power Map. But uh, again, two or three years ago, uh, I don't see any Power View. I mean, maybe it's uh, it's not used. Okay. Yeah. If I'm mistaken, and uh, what was the reason uh, not to go on with Power View? And uh, so, actually, uh, all kinds of visualization uh, point of view. I mean, we could do uh, several reports. Not no. Uh, there is a there is a simple there is a simple explanation that is very technical. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are different explanations, but there is one reason that is you, you can we can be very clear about that. Power View was. Uh, written using Silverlight, which is a technology that Microsoft dismissed mm -hmm. and is no longer support. The problem I see is that Microsoft announced that Silverlight would have been abandoned before uh, or just close to the release of PowerView. So, which means that because a company doesn't decide to announce something, you know, 10 days before. They probably knew that for a long time. This means that they started the development of PowerView knowing that they should have changed the technology for, the, for its implementation. And this is something I always, uh, I, I have always been a little bit uh, critical about that because I, I understood that the reason of we need to ship something, but I don't know, you know, I, I would have made other choices. There were other technologies available and a company like Maxo could have made better choice for that. Even though I, I understand the reason why they did this, but I still think that it could have, that it could have been bad, much better because it had, it had been expensive. They had uh, expensive for Maxo, for the customers, for, for many people involved, so, but, but Power BI is the, uh, you know, is the next implementation of Power View, right? So Power View was like the beta, and then they rewrote everything, and now we have Power BI. So you can you can see, you can think about Power View this way. You are muted. No. No, you're muted. I cannot hear you. Okay, sorry. Now I'm, I think I'm muted. Last question. Do you have any idea to write, uh, uh, to write uh, codes regarding software like Power BI or not? Sorry, to write? I, I mean, I mean um, if I'm not mistaken, some parts of Power BI I mean, um, is coded, have been coded by you, right? I mean, like Tech Studio okay. or something like yeah, this. Yeah, no, 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 why, okay. why, why don't you uh, make your own software, something like uh, Power BI? Uh, okay, so uh, writing software is a huge effort, and it's something that today can be made only by companies that have, uh, well, it depends. You can write, but writing software is a complex is a complex job, and you should do that one hundred percent of your time. You should have a company doing that. It's not something that just because oh I now I, I write software and uh, I as a Microsoft contributor we uh, I and Daniele Perilli we we wrote small very small parts of our They didn't have time to do everything, so they, they with, with 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 a certain effort we we solved a few.
problems that were, for example, for Euro for the separator in DAX code. But it's 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 an expensive process because you can imagine that entering into the, the code of a project like Power BI, and um, even though you have to write a small amount of code, but the time to coordinate everything is huge. So it, it's a complex job. And to be honest, the, the as much as I like to write code, because it was uh, the way I started working in IT, but it's uh, it's it's another job. I mean, to, as of today, I, uh, I I'm I I use my skills for writing code, contributing to some tools, but it's the maximum I can do. I if if I move to to software development, it would be a completely different. And, and I need I would need many other people. I'm. If I'm good to write some code, it doesn't mean that I'm good to manage people. So, or to manage a large organization to, to 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 write code, it would be a different job. So, it's not the same. Thank you for your answer. Now we are uh, receiving a thank you messages. If you don't uh, mind, I mean everybody, please uh, turn your turn on your uh, video. I mean camera. I would like to take a picture, and uh, if you have something to share with uh, Mr. Marco, we will be very happy. By the way, I would like to take it an opportunity to welcome my boss, Mr. Elshan, who is my boss. And uh, welcome, I'm saying welcome to him and also others. It's very really honor for me uh, to have Marco Russo at our meetup session, and I'd like to thank to everybody who uh, actively participated in this meetup session. Also, uh, specifically, to I would, I'm very thankful to Christian Angel to his question. So, okay, okay, yes, the picture is ready. I will okay. share later. <laughs> okay, so if you something to tell or to ask, please you may share. I, I see many many people in the in the chat window saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you yes. all. I'm glad to have spent time this evening. Now yes. we have. And okay. uh, one moment, I would like to tell, to share with you. Uh, Christian Angel is the organizer of Romania Power BI and the Modern Excel User Meetup Group, and he is going to have Kai in you, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, right, Christian. Yeah, on the 24th. Thank you. Oh, yes, on the 24th. So please join. Don't miss this opportunity. So, so uh, once again, I would like to thank you, Marco. Uh, it was an honor for me to have you as a guest speaker in our meetup group. Just for your information, in next year, we are going to organize Azerbaijan Exam Base event on May. Actually, we organized it in previous year due to pandemic situation, we couldn't do it, but I strongly believe that we are going to do it in next year on May. So I think uh, it's time to say goodbye. Uh, so if you don't mind, I would like to end our meetup session. Once again, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 B